Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we're discussing a key aspect of a much discussed topic, American policy on refugees and asylum seekers coming to our borders with special guests, Maureen White, Executive Director of Refugees International, David McKeever, CEO of Refugee Services of Texas, and Krishna Mara Vignaraja, CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services. Thank you all for being here. The U.S. provides protection to certain uh, persecuted peoples through two programs. The refugee program is for those outside the United States and eligible um, uh, and eligible relatives, while the asylum program is for those within and arriving at the United States at the U.S. borders. The current Refugee Act program was passed in 1980 as an amendment to the Immigration Nationality Act of 1965 and the Migration and Refugee Assistance Act of of 1962. So the intent of these laws was to provide a permanent and systematic procedure for the admission to the United States of refugees uh, of special humanitarian need and to provide an effective resettlement and absorption of those uh, refugees. But Krish, let me ask you something in all candor. We've seen a lot of news coverage about what is going on at our borders. Um, and if you take a look at our per capita absorption of refugees here in the United States, we are really, really low down on the totem pole of people who open their hearts and borders uh, to uh, refugees. Uh, what kind of a grade do we receive here in this in this country? And how can we actually stand by our values in a way that that is uh, faithful to those values? Yeah, um, Mark, thank you so much for hosting this conversation. Thank you for having me. Um, candidly, I'm probably a harsh grader, but I think that this is a candid and honest assessment. Um, I think we would give them a B minus, a C plus. Uh, part of that is just, I think, taking into account the kind of current context of where we are. There are 100 million people displaced globally, um, more than any time in our history. The current administration has definitely done better than the last one. Um, you know, obviously, we've seen in the news um, some great coverage of the work uh, resettling Afghans and Ukrainians, starting to rebuild the refugee resettlement system, um, pushing an end to problematic policies like remain in Mexico in Title 42. But, you know, as you know, the U.S. has resettled only 20 percent of the 125,000 refugees we said we would in 2022. Um, the Biden administration has set a goal of 125,000 refugee admissions for next year. But in order for us to get anywhere close to that, we need to boost and streamline refugee applications um, that are being processed overseas because we are facing unprecedented global displacement crises. And that's where I think the administration needs to really focus on how do they build infrastructure? How do they make sure that they use you know, innovative technology just as we are using you know, Zoom for this um, conversation using video conference capability. So it isn't just about you know, judges adjudicating cases overseas. Those are the meaningful steps that we need to take in order to truly meet our role as a global humanitarian leader. I have a question for you, David, um, given what, what uh, Chris was just saying, and I, I don't think you're a harsh grader at all. As a matter of fact, I would, I would have given us a, a more harsh grade because under the current policies, my relatives wouldn't have gotten into this country. There's no way. And uh, not only would my relatives not, not have gotten into this, this country, so many people who are opposing uh, a more generous uh, refugee and resettlement uh, policy, so many of their relatives wouldn't have gotten into this country either. My question is this, David, and, and you're, you're so well situated uh, given your location in Texas where there is this, this tension of course, right. because so much of the burden hits Texas. So much of the burden hits Texas, and that's unfair. Um, why should we be considering a more generous policy toward refugees, or should we be considering a more generous policy of, uh, uh, toward refugees? You deal with this all the time. Absolutely. What is the answer that you, that you provide people? Uh, Mark, like you previously stated, look, uh, a lot of us are at one point of our lives, uh, part of a refugee uh, program. Again, I think the Biden administration is doing a wonderful job. Uh, however, we're just not we're just not fast enough in our uh, processes. Um, 
like Chris stated, you know, the presidential determination for fiscal year 22 was 125,000. However, the, the number in fiscal year 21 was 62.5. We need to increase those numbers. Um, I think that we here in Texas do an amazing job, you know, when, when individuals are coming into our state. Yes, there is some friction going on between federal and state. However, it's our job to make sure that we're doing everything that we can to make a better life uh, for these refugees. There's so many things that, you know, they need on a daily basis that we can provide. Uh, we have the capacity to do it uh, here in, within our state and within our country as well. And so I just think that we need to, uh, as a country, uh, be better, uh, welcome more people into our country. You know, again, we're, we're way down on the totem pole. Why should I I care, David, if I'm if I'm a let's say I have a small store Mm -hmm. that is selling something. Let's say I'm I'm, I'm selling um, clothing or I'm selling um, uh, food or or whatever it happens to be. Uh, Let's say I'm a rancher. Let's say I'm a farmer. Correct. Uh, Why should I care about my tax dollars being spent? on supporting refugees and asylum seekers. Why should because I be supportive of that? If you're a farmer in the United States, you know, those um, refugees can become essential workers. Those are people who can actually work on your farm, work in our community, make our community better. They become entrepreneurs. You know, they can they can uplift this country. You know, it's not a burden on us, right? This is this is a, we all have to realize that a lot of us was not born in this country. And so those people become productive citizens. Uh, and make make this country you know what it is. This is an amazing country. Let's not, not let's not you know put that to the side. And the more individuals, this is this continues to be a melting pot. And so uh, again, essential workers, you know, people who contribute to our neighborhoods and our state and our, our nation. Uh, I think this is a it's a wonderful thing. So, Maureen, David is making both a values judgment, uh, a values argument, and an economic argument, right? David's making the argument that not only should we do this just because it's the right thing to do and it connects to our history, but also because economically it, it's beneficial. We have a labor shortage, certainly in certain industries. Um, you know, the the entrepreneurial energy of people who are um, who have gone through some really tough times and are really incentivized to, to make it work here um, is, is part of the energy that he's talking about. What, are, what do you at Refugees International see in terms of trying to convince others who might have a, a greater skepticism? One of the things that people, um, should realize, uh, are two points that I would just make. First and foremost, the numbers coming over the border in the United States, you know, there are different populations that we're talking about. The one that gets the most attention in the headlines and on the news shows of the people coming over the border. And there are large numbers. I should point out that in terms of people being apprehended at the border now versus what was happening in the 1990s, it was a larger percentage of the population in the 1990s than our numbers now. And at a time when the U.S. GNP was a fraction of what it is right now, our economy has grown so strong. Our population has not grown much stronger. So we have both financial resources and the um, space to take in more refugees now than we have been over the border that have that we have were 40 years ago when we dealt with this crisis. Arguably, it was hard 40 years ago, but there was no much near as much backlash. 40 years ago than there is now. Are you saying that the backlash actually isn't founded necessarily in fact? It's more- I would say that 100, I I would say that there, you know, the way the media sees this issue has been much more politicized than it was 40 years ago. But let me step back and say something else about the asylum process, because one of the things we see now at the border is it's what we would call a mixed population. There are some people looking for a better life. People are fleeing hunger, unemployment, and things like that. They want a better life, okay? I came from a community of people. I'm 100% Irish. The people in Ireland were were dying, so they came to the United States, and they were welcome. We have those people trying to get to the United States, but we also have a category of people who fit specifically the asylum category, which is what our um, topic today is about. And asylum is people who are who fear to go home. 
because they cannot live. They are under threat of persecution or brutalization, not just hunger and unemployment, but the refuge, the asylum definition, the asylum laws in this country and globally are pretty much targeted at those who have no choice because they will face violence if returned. And I think if we look at a sort of big historic view of this, the asylum laws were established after World War II. And there had been a movement towards lower refugee asylum in the 50 or 60 years before World War II. But these are not the law. They're the law of the land in the United States in federal law and in most state laws that a person fleeing persecution or fear for their life has a legal right to enter this country. So a political figure in New York once said to me, why do we let these people in? And I turned to him and I said, because it's the law. And so there's a moral reason, there's an economic reason, and there's a legal reason. Arguably, we can change the laws, but we haven't changed the laws. And there is not there is not an overwhelming popular agenda for prohibiting people fearing persecution in light and threatening circumstances from seeking asylum. We've got we've got a moral, an economic, and a legal responsibility to do that. So there's, there's a global pushback against this. And it's quite troubling. But here in the United States, it was difficult during the last administration. It's gotten better with this administration, but it's far from perfect. The protection. I, I, have, a question. Right. I have a question for you all. Um, if you take a look at this from a, I'm going to separate the economic side from the moral side. Um, you know, you've got Chris, who represents a Lutheran immigration and refugee services, which comes out of a Lutheran tradition. We have. Um, uh, 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 a more a more um, secular uh, two two more secular groups. To what extent does the uh, do we interact on a moral basis uh, as uh, in this country? We can't necessarily um, foist our morality, our ideas of values, on everybody in the world. But to what extent do we think about? Um, enacting policies, like in this case, that really are about people who are caught between uh, death and fleeing, right? To what extent is this important uh, to who we are as a country and what we represent? Krish, um, how do you see this in terms of this idea of democracy and uh, creating a world that we actually all want to live in? And I, I think um, it's all additive. What I mean by that is there are a number of arguments for why the U.S. needs to continue to be a welcoming nation. Um, everything from what David was mentioning about the economics, what Maureen was mentioning about the legality and upholding our U.S. and international obligations. But I do think it's also under, important to understand for many faiths, welcoming the stranger is the core value. And so freedom of religion is in part expressed by the ability to welcome um, you know, uh, new Americans and immigrants who are fleeing the most dire of circumstances. But it also relates to our national security. Um, obviously, Ukraine and Afghanistan are two concrete recent examples of why you know, some of our strongest advocates are veterans and national security officials. Um, but I also think that there is a morality of the U.S. has always been that beacon of hope and freedom. And for us to maintain global humanitarian leadership, I think re requires us to understand why are people fleeing? Some of the reasons are obviously the more traditional reasons, reasons of war, persecution, violence. Um, when people ask, well, why would a mother allow for her child to go uh, unaccompanied a thousand miles, right, through jungles, through Mexican cartels? Well, because the alternative that she faces is actually worse. I mean, just imagine that, right? What is that child? What is that family facing? But on top of that, I also think it's important to at least just touch on the climate crisis. At least a third of the migrants that we are working with today are fleeing a climate related disaster more than 20 million per year right now. And that's only going to get worse by 2050. We expect 200 million climate displaced persons. Climate displaced uh, displacement. So you're talking about refugees who are fleeing for political reasons. You're talking about refugees um, and asylum seekers who are fleeing violence. 
you're talking about people who are fleeing because of climate. And, and the, the real question is, how do we interact with, with, uh, with people on these uh, different bases? David, when you're interacting with people in a state that is very famously led by people who are making c- certain points, um, either by uh, advocating uh, closing of the borders or by busing people to different states. And there's a there's a valid element of this, right? Because the border states are absolutely uh, bearing a disproportionate uh, part of this impact, and they need more support. Uh, how do you uh, convince somebody that um, that there are different approaches that are a mix that include um, different aspects, and there's not just a black or white kind of a kind of a situation here? How do you get people? to move a little bit on each side and come together uh, on solutions? Or, or can you? That's a great question, Mark. I think for the most part, individuals want to know um, on the other side of the fence, they want to make sure that people are doing things the legal way. And we want to make sure that we we are providing that information. We are doing everything that we can to bring hope to individuals who want to come to this country the legal way. Uh, and so we have to make sure everything is documented, we have to make sure that we're 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 audited. You know, everything is you know up to standard, and we have to make sure that we're voicing ourselves and making sure that we're saying we're a good agency. We're doing things the right way, and we're doing things again the legal way. Marina's absolutely right. I think most individuals know that this is the right thing for our, our country to do. It's the legal thing for our country to do. They just want to make sure that we're doing things the right way, right? And nobody is coming in this country undocumented. And, and committing crimes. And so there's a, a scare tactic that's going on here um, brought on by the previous administration. We want to make sure that we kind of put that far out and say, we're doing the right things. Um, there, there's a lot of steps to becoming a U.S. citizen. Um, there's a lot of different programs. And, and so we want to make sure- thing you're talking about is diminishing fear, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Get, get back to facts, to facts that we can actually all look at mm-hmm. and stop stop the this sort of fear mongering correct uh, correct Marine, if if you were then going to go from from stopping fear mongering and you get people in a room you're going to say okay what kind of policies do do we need to have and one of the policies that seemed to me to be pretty obvious is that you share the burden so that the border states are not uh, bearing such a disproportionate particularly mm-hmm. the southern border states are not uh, bearing such a disproportionate a share I mean, I do think the governors who are busing people, although I, I think it's an, abor- an abhorrent uh, tactic to make a point, but they do have a point in that there should be more burden sharing throughout the country. So maybe that's another thing. But is, are there other um, um, actions that we can all take to create a solution rather than these incessant arguments that are unproductive? Um, you raise a good point because... Um it is true that the southern states, some some southern states, do bear a disproportionate share of the burden of the people who are coming over immediately. Again, and I refer to this population coming over the border as sort of a, a mixed mixed population. Okay, some are some are actually fearing. The reasons for fleeing are differently, and some of them are treated differently because of the different origins of their motivation, and. Some are coming here um, to rejoin family members legitimately with their fear for their life and they've got a place to go when they come to the United States. The problem is with what has happened at the southern border is the processing of these individuals who come across is so burdensome and so um, uh, inappropriately funded that they end up congregating in those parts of the country rather than going to the other parts of the country where they have relatives, where they know work is. And so the processing backlog has fed into this narrative of crisis. If the people were processed quickly, and the Biden administration just in this past year has made some pretty significant policy changes to speed up the processing the processing of those who are coming over to seek permanent asylum. Some want to rejoin relatives, some want to stay temporarily, some are looking for temporary protected status, 
would be provided to certain nations which have conflict. So there are many categories. It is the backlog and the processing problem, which was previously, um, it, which is a function of what happened in the previous administration. Cleaning up that mess has taken longer than people wanted. It costs more and it necessitates a whole new hiring and infrastructure building process on the border, which hasn't happened yet. And if the processing were in place, the bur there wouldn't be so many people congregating in these states because they would be processed and moved on to other parts of the country. To what extent is, is what we're experiencing about race, about, the, about uh, so many people who are coming into this country, um, are Spanish speakers, um, are um, uh, people of color um, are uh, are um, coming in with particular traditions and religions and cultural uh, um, attributes that um, where where they're where that is viewed as but by, by certain folks as threatening the American um, uh, identity and cultural mix and shifting that. You know, I hear sometimes. Um, these remarks, which which are either bordering on or uh, very overtly uh, racially tinged. And um, I, I look at that and I'm thinking, you know, are we not talking about a big issue that is causing this lack of efficiency? Is it is it just administrative or is it um, intentional as a way to um, to a, as a tactic? Uh, to create facts on the ground that um, elevate um, uh, tensions, political tensions, and so on, for political purposes. Uh, Krish, uh, David, Maureen, do you have uh, any any views on this? And is there a way that we can finesse that um, to create solutions rather than these unproductive debates? I, I think again, I think it's a tactic. You know, I think it's it's more of a political tactic. But we have to get the message out that, you know, people that come through our programs are can become uh, amazing citizens. We have to tell stories. We have to get our story out there and say this is what individuals are doing in our community, because I, I think it's no, nothing more than a scare tactic that says, you know, it's us against them. It should not. Our country should not be that way. It should be a, a, a blend of citizenship. It's uh, this tactic is is only politically driven uh, is for individuals who want to see themselves remain in office for some reason or another. Um, th that's as simple as that. Do we have to create a balance where um, the parties are not identified um, with those um, uh, values where everybody's in one corner? You know, we we hear talk of, about the the fact that it used to be the parties we're not all clustered around a certain set of issues or a certain set of voters. Uh, and now increasingly um, everybody's in their corner and there's no way to talk with, with each other. How do we, how do we deal with this? One part of my role is since we operate in, uh, you know, nearly 40 States, we're talking to people in the reddest of red States, the bluest of blue States. And what's interesting to me is when I'm having these conversations, they're actually quite reasonable. Um, you know, we talk about how do we uh, avoid misperception? How do we fight fiction with fact? And then we also talk about how do you actually get to those policy solutions? The vast majority of people, right? The, the vast majority of people believe that we shouldn't have an entirely open border or an entirely closed border, right? Most people believe we need to have policies where there's a process where that's efficient, effective. So people aren't waiting 20 years to reunify with family. For people who want economic visas, seasonal workers, they don't necessarily want America to be their home, right? But they want jobs and our employers need um, them to be productive workers here. And so I think the question is, how do we try to get this out of that political realm? Because that is where, you know, you do see people going into their corners and trying to make this a wedge issue, right? Trying not to solve the problem so it remains an active debate. It can be an opposition ad. Um, but I think the most people 
want the U.S. to have a system where you can wait your turn, you can apply for a visa, you don't necessarily need to come to our border, right, to make your case. But I think the reality right now is that so many of our immigration programs are dysfunctional, right? Why do we have a 660 thousand backlog of asylum seekers? Why does less than 1% of refugees get resettled? Why is it that 20,000 Ukrainians came across our southern border because there was no better process while Haitians were being summarily dis displaced um, and expelled? So I think that is where when you actually talk to Americans, and, and I mean conservatives in between, there is actually a desire to get to solutions but we need to push Congress, um, not just the administration, to finally get there. So you're you're basically saying that instead of thinking about nonsense politics, we should be thinking about real solutions that actually work. And what you're saying is that we should actually listen to each other and try and come out with some balance that uh, takes the valid concerns of everybody. Let's look at let's look at uh, facts together. Let's look at values together. Right, David. And 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 figure it out. It's it is within our power, but as long as it's being used as a political tool, that's too enticing, right? Instead of dealing with with solutions, you're using it as a, 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 a as a wedge issue, and you want to keep that wedge issue on both sides. But let's get rid of that wedge is issue and let's start doing something that is functional for the country and for its economics and for businesses and for people who are actually fleeing. Um, these these circumstances is that is that how you're looking at it as well, David? Absolutely. Again, this is um, if we all just sit down uh, and and talk about uh, the options that we have to bring in individuals in this country and the impact that they can make in our country. This is this is all can be you know much better. Maureen, uh, we're going to give you the last word as long as your your tech holds up. Um, uh, how, do, how do you see what action can we all take, all of us, to um, encourage that type of problem solving? Well, I, you know, I, I don't think we could solve every aspect of it in, or in very soon or in our lifetime. And I th think we have to segment out the things that we can make change on and the things that we can't. A comprehensive immigration bill won't happen as long as there is a dysfunctional Congress. And we do not, there are, there is not any kind of consensus within conference in Congress, and there hasn't been for 25 years about comprehensive immigration. So big things have to change one way or the other in Congress for has to have comprehensive immigration form. We can make changes on things like um, asylum, okay? And the Biden administration has come up with, so if they are implemented and if they are funded, will make it much easier and much faster and much more legal, and much more legally accessible for people, asylum seekers coming across their border to have their case heard by an asylum officer and to be able to move on and get certain benefits from being an asylum seeker in the United States, including a pathway to citizenship. So the asylum thing, processing the asylum claims of those fleeing things that are protected under the Refugee Convention will be sped, sped up if certain things are funded and people hired at the border in the United States as the Biden administration has outlined. There is temporary protection status for people like those from Venezuela who don't want to leave their country forever. They'd like safety in this country for now, but they have every intention, if and when things get better, of going back. There should be programs for um, temporary workers who want to work in seasonal um, labor, as seasonal laborers. There are many, many pieces of these puzzle. We've got to go after them where we can make progress and hope for change down the road when the political coloration of this country changes. You know, you're all making a, a really important point, which uh, I'll summarize is this. Let's, let's forget about parties. Let's instead get people who are making these policies, who are looking at facts, who are looking at the welfare of the country, who are looking at values and who are talking to each other and who are willing to make compromise. I mean, let's get people who we would want to uh, give some authority to because of their values and because of, of how they think. Instead of just uh, voting uh, voting by party, 
Let's vote for people who are really good at, at, at doing this stuff. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your experiences with us. Maureen White, Executive Director of Refugees International, David McKeever, CEO of Refugee Services of Texas, and Krish Omara uh, Vignaraja, uh, CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Services. Your work is so very important to the country, to the future of, of, of the United States. Uh, thank, your, thank your staff, thank your boards, thank your funders. Uh, thank your clients for their persistence, um, and and thank you. Um, have a great day, and uh, we'll we'll catch you uh, as you move forward. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for this conversation. Thank you.